All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Adrian Sersenya. He's a retired U.S. Space Force and Air Force officer with 21 years of leadership experience. His area of expertise in information technology and cybersecurity revolves around math, cryptography, data analysis, risk mitigation and risk management. He discovered Bitcoin in 2011, but it was not until 2016 that he started his journey for real. First with shitcoins before learning a couple difficult and expensive lessons, starting over in 2019 to truly go down the Bitcoin only rabbit hole. That's uh, that's going to be fun to talk about. But uh, yeah, welcome, Adrian. Hey, thanks, Bram, for uh, having me on your show. I'm looking forward to the discussions. Yeah, man, me too. I, I love that you shared with me that, you know, you discovered it in 2011, two years before me. I think uh, the earlier you got it, the more difficult it well, found it, the more difficult it was to actually get it, right? Like currently we have so much resources, you know, and places where people can learn about Bitcoin. But, you know, 2011 was really still, uh, it, it was in a in huge ob obscurity, I would say, right? Um, but yeah, can you tell us a bit about like how how did you find it? Why didn't you take action? And like what what was the thing that held you back? Yeah, yeah. Well, one comment, and uh, you know, I completely echo uh, what you just said. You know, people coming into Bitcoin today, there's so much information, so much signal available to them. Whether it's all the books that have been published, all the podcasts um, that are out there, all the conferences, it's it's a lot easier, I think, to learn about Bitcoin today than it was way back then. A little bit of my story. So I first found Bitcoin in 2011. And it was, it was kind of tangentially related to my job. Um, and really, it was kind of following the money, right? Uh, I was active duty military at the time. And it was during what I would call kind of the peak of the global war on terrorism. And Bitcoin was one of those things that kept coming up about how it's used for illicit purposes on the dark web. And that's really what kind of put it on my radar. Unfortunately for me, um, I required a security clearance for my job at the time, and it was one of those things that I really couldn't put my hands on, and so I, I stayed away for a long time. And it wasn't until you know many years later, when I was living in Europe, and I was in Tallinn, Estonia, when I started to see more um, Bitcoin and blockchain types of things. It's actually where I saw my first Bitcoin ATM machine, and really that's kind of what cool. forced me to take a second and a deeper look at what Bitcoin really was. Yeah. And so did you, you encountered it then very early? I think it's really interesting actually, right? Like that in the position that you were in, that you already found Bitcoin to be used, you know, in certain transactions, the fact that, you know, it was already, already used back then. Like, did you, did you understand what it was? Like, did you, was it just a, a thing that, you know, came across the desk basically, or did you like dive into it already at that, at that moment, just no, to understand it, it came, like how it worked? It came across my desk and, you know, back then, um, a lot of it was related to like the pseudo anonymity of Bitcoin, right? And people who could transact anywhere around the world without necessarily having to divulge their identity. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of the uses were and still are on the dark web uh, today. And so I didn't really take that first deep dive in 2011. And it wasn't until 2016 when I still, when I started to really go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Unfortunately for me, that was a terrible time to start with like, you know, ICO era and a lot of, a lot of pump and dumps. Like you'd mentioned in the intro, I had quickly um, shifted my attention to other shit coins you know, I went in with that same mindset that a lot of people do that, oh, you know, Bitcoin is too high. I've missed the boat. So what's the next best thing? And in 2016, we didn't have, you know, memes like there is no second best. Um, and so I, I did go down the shitcoin rabbit hole. And it wasn't until that bear market following the ICU era where I really wanted to go back down to basics and really study the underlying asset. And that's what, you know, led me to believe and, and really grew my conviction with Bitcoin and Bitcoin only. Yeah. So how do you reflect on that? If you, if you would look back now, it's, it's funny because I also, I discovered Ethereum at like 60, $70 or something. And then, 
the ICO era came around and I always kind of approached it as like, of, I was a student back then. So I was all, also like, uh, oh, well, no, I was, I was working actually, but it was more like trying to make money on the side, not, not different than NFTs now or like all that stuff. Like it's the, it's the same game. Right. But I, I knew that a lot of it was trash just because in general, you know, a lot of startup ideas are trash, which, you know, is fine. But so I, I, I was in it just to discover what are people working on and playing around and, you know, trying to get an edge, of course. And I don't really know how I eventually, I was already in Bitcoin, but like got back to, to Bitcoin. Is there anything you can remember from that time? Like why, what was it that made you go back to, to Bitcoin? Yeah, that's an easy one. And I, I still have this address just to look back on. I've got an old Ethereum address with a bunch of shit coins in it. And I look at it from a block explorer and there there may be like 10 or 15 different shit coins um, still held in that wallet. All of them are down 99% or they're <laughs> completely non-existent now. And so yeah. I use that in conversations with people and I don't really care about that address anymore. And I'll show them and say, hey, this this is what happens when you put money in projects that have insiders, pre-sales, um, and you know foundations, CEOs, things like that. Versus Bitcoin, which is the only project that had a fair, completely fair issuance. It started with zero value. Um, versus something like Ethereum, and I don't remember the numbers. Like thirty percent pre-sale to insiders. Um, when we're looking at different technologies and different products, I think there's there's potentially some merit there. But when we're looking at something that is, you know, the underlying monetary system that could potentially be the global reserve asset for the world, really, there, there's only one um, in my eyes, and that's Bitcoin. Hey there. I want to ask you for a quick favor. If you're enjoying our conversations on Bitcoin for Millennials, please consider hitting the subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your favorite podcasting app. Subscribing helps me grow this channel, ensuring more great content each week. Yeah, it's interesting when you come to that realization, right? I had a, I was a guest yesterday on an, on an interview and the, interv the interviewer, she asked me like, what do you also invest in, um, well, first I had to explain her is I don't see it as investing, but saving. But then she said, like, do you invest in other cryptos? And I think it's really important that we share this more, right? I think to to allude to what you're saying is like Bitcoin is the discovery of finite digital scarcity and cryptos, or crypto tokens are made by startups that want to create a system in, in which that token is used to, you know, do things and therefore it has value and yes, it uses blockchain in some way, shape or form. And maybe it's a bit faster than a a bit than, uh, than Bitcoin, but in, in like doing transactions with the tokens, but they are totally different things, you know? And uh, it, she looked at me like, oh, I never thought about it like that. And I think that's still the stage that we're in, right? Like you have to, you have to learn by doing essentially. Yeah, 100%. It's funny because I had a conversation with uh, one of my friends not too long ago. And he said, hey, my friend told me about shitcoin XYZ. And I ended up sending him a lot of information on why I am Bitcoin only. And then a couple of weeks later, he said, hey, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, because he, he was on the verge of getting rug pulled for going mm -hmm. into some other project. And I can confidently say now because he's reached out a number of times that uh, he's starting his own journey down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun to see that, right? Like you, you cannot orange pill someone else, but it's fun to see, you know, you know that people are on the right track when they ask the right questions. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's part of it too, is um, asking, being willing to ask a question is, is really the first step. A lot of times yes. people will, will see things on the internet and they'll try to do their own research. And unfortunately, there's still a lot of uh, bad information and FUD floating around out there. Um, but once they start to do their own homework and they start to ask, you know, the more meaningful questions is when you know that they're, they're ready, they're mentally ready to start yeah. that journey. Yeah. 
So what eventually made you see Bitcoin and wh when you understood it, like what was it that clicked for you? Well, it, it, it's like you said, it's that absolute uh, finite scarcity. It's the, you know, programmatically built in 21 million cannot ever be changed and any attempts, and we've seen attempts in the past, but any attempt to change that finite scarcity um, results in node operators being willing to vote for that new system or voting not for that new system. And so it takes that that consensus model and the game theory of consensus to be able to change Bitcoin. And really, once I came to that realization on how it works, um, it's, it's not controlled by a, an entity or a company or a foundation. Really, it's, it's controlled by each of the participants. Mm -hmm. And so finite scarcity and consensus with participants is really what uh, sold me on Bitcoin and Bitcoin only. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so, so funny sometimes when you hear critics talk about, but there could be a better Bitcoin and then, uh, you know, this is not first mover advantage, blah, blah. But then I always say like, but you can make a better Bitcoin. Why isn't there a better Bitcoin? Like anyone can make, you know, I can make Bram coin, Bram Bitcoin, but <laughs> nobody would want to be a node on my Bram Bitcoin network, right? And I think that's ex actually a very good point, right? Like that game theory is very much alive. And so the incentives are not, I like that a lot about Bitcoin, like the incentives are not individual, they are mutual, right? And so if you think you should adopt Bram Bitcoin, you know, my, my fork, if you think that as, as one node runner, then you have the wrong incentive because you're thinking for yourself, right? And so the yeah. entire idea of the Bitcoin network is that you think for each other. You follow the rules because everyone else follows the rules, basically. And I love that 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 way of how the incentives are aligned is actually what is kind of like the unbreakable yeah, element or, I don't know, thing. I don't know what to call that, right? But it's more like a social contract almost. It's not even something that is written, right? It's It's like an agreement but it's not on paper. Yeah, that's the anti-fragility of Bitcoin. You know, uh, Nicholas Nassem Taleb talks about anti-fragileness in his book, Anti-Fragile. And we've gotten to the point now with Bitcoin where any attempts or attacks on Bitcoin have actually shown and proven that Bitcoin gets stronger with these types of attacks. Yeah. And I, I think that that just brings merit to the space you know, being just over 15 years old and growing from zero valuation and zero participants to, um, you know, the, the 67 or the 68K USD, whatever that number is uh, today. And, you know, the, the millions of participants all around the globe on layer one and layer two, I think just speaks to that, that power and that strength and that anti-fragility of Bitcoin. Yeah. So do you see it as saving or investing? Ooh, um, I used to see it as investing. Now I think it's the ultimate savings technology, right? Um, as long as we continue to denominate Bitcoin in fiat terms, whether that's dollars or euros, um, I think there's going to be some appearance of volatility. Um, but when we look at things like one of my favorite sites is priced in Bitcoin21.com. When we start to look at the price of goods going down in Bitcoin terms, it really is the ultimate savings technology. And that's kind of the lens that I look at Bitcoin through today. Yeah. Yeah. I just saw a tweet from American HODL uh, about the average home price in America, which is like 6.1 Bitcoin now or something like that. Uh, a few, few months ago, I did the same analysis for the homes in my country. I think it's also around around six and you see that in the last 10 years in euros the houses went up 92 percent and with bitcoin it went down i don't even know it went from like 1100 bitcoin to like six or seven bitcoin now and uh it's so funny because when i show that graph to people and i say like this is why it's a savings vehicle it's a better savings vehicle than a home, right? Or a wealth creation vehicle. And people 
it's so funny like people are so stuck right like they don't even know what is wealth creation what is wealth <laughs> right or what is saving versus investing they people use these words you know they intertwine it all the time right but you know investing implies risk and saving implies doing nothing and sitting on your hands right like the just you don't have to do anything and and your money is safe but uh yeah most people don't get that yeah and and i think that it's going to be one of those things that history will look back on and it'll it'll appear so obvious that why didn't the people of that time or of today um, come to the realization sooner that you don't necessarily have to, you know, have your money work for you in investments on a stock market or buying real estate and taking, you know, excessive risk um, when the underlying asset itself is going to grow in value as everything else gets repriced against Bitcoin. Yeah. And so who or what has been most influential for you with regards to like money, risk, wealth? What what did you learn before Bitcoin about that? You know, it, it's interesting because um, it's not something that I was taught in school when I was growing up about, about money and inflation and debasement. And I, I came from a different environment where... Um, you know, kind of frugality and savings were important. And I, I wish I knew sooner that, you know, the debasement of the, the fiat currency is really what we, you know, what a lot of Bitcoiners talk about as that melting ice cube and that devaluation and, you know, the decrease in purchasing power of that dollar that's saved in a bank account. And it wasn't until really um, I discovered Bitcoin that I really started to learn about these other you know, financial and economic terms. Prior to that, I was involved in investing in the stock market, doing a little bit of real estate um, for the the air quote cash flow of a real estate investment. Um, and ever ever since discovering Bitcoin, I've slowly been pivoting away from all of these these other types of investments and really just saving in Bitcoin. That's interesting. That they don't make sense to you anymore or what what is it that makes you not want to use that like those vehicles you it a lot of it is like the carry on risk and so i'll i'll use a um an example of today so i've got an an old real estate property that you know based on you know the the economy and how it is today i had a tenant in there that uh has been skipping on paying rent for a while and so we, we call that carry risk, right? Or there's a, additional risks for natural disaster. So I've got a tenant in a property that I own that hasn't been paying rent for a while, finally got them evicted, had to take them to court to get evicted and um, quite a bit of damage left on that property. And so you could invest in real estate and have that carry risk of natural disaster, bad tenants, damage, maintenance, repair, or, and, and what I am most likely going to do is do all the repairs and renovations and then sell that property and move whatever value is there into what I think is the superior savings technology in Bitcoin. Um, yeah. and, and it's a perfect example of why I no longer um, in are, I'm no longer interested in other types of investments and really just focus on on Bitcoin. Yeah, I think the real estate example is really good, right? Because I, I wanted to make the joke about cash flows, you know. But I, th <laughs> I, I think um, I think you are totally right, you know. It, and, and also, I'm trying to think about how to visualize it. But you say you said, if I sell it, any value that's left, I will put in Bitcoin, you said. And I think that's such an interesting concept, right? Just in general, the concept of value or... I use energy a lot, right? Like it is, you bought that house with money, you know, which is packaged energy that you got for for spending your own energy and time. And you you put that into a house, right? So I always visualize it not with like, like currency signs, but more like there's like this, I don't know, like blob of energy and you you you, you put it in this house, right? And you use the house to protect the the energy, and 
because you have the cash flow, you know, you can um, maintain that house, that protection of that energy. And then, you know, it, it does slowly, it, it looks like it slowly grows in some way, right? But the way you denominate the energy, the way you put a price on the value of the energy, that is a flawed thing, right? Like that, that is, if you use dollars, that is what is actually debasing. So you get more units of currency, but that doesn't mean that the energy you store is the same. And like, even now when I'm talking about it, it's like, it's also abstracted, right? There's all these layers and all these things. Like, it's just really hard to understand. And like, if I visualize Bitcoin, I see it as like this digital cube in cyberspace, like a 3D cube, and you just put your blob of energy in and like, that that's just it <laughs> you know and every 10 minutes you can verify if the if the 3d cube in cyberspace still exists and like that is it like it's yeah. i don't know it feels so much simpler yeah no it it makes completely complete sense and i forget who actually um came up with the analogy but i i really like it and you know money like you said take away the dollar signs or the euro signs but money is that ledger of your time, energy, and productivity that you save to be able to use or spend at some point in the future, value for value for someone else's time, energy, and productivity. Yes. And unfortunately, when uh, the system is manipulated, and you know, another investment we talk about stocks is like um, investing in the US and the S&P 500. I saw an interesting chart not too long ago about the S&P 500, um, but denominated against M2 money supply. And the yes. interesting thing with that chart is actually the S&P 500, while they say it's at, you know, all time highs is yeah. actually pretty much flat. And yes. the same could be true about real estate. You know, real estate appears, has the appearance of going up in value, but really it's only because it's been diluted by all of the money printing over the past you know, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever that particular investment you have and how long you've had it. Yeah. Uh, and so that manipulated system is really what uh, confuses people and prevents them from seeing Bitcoin as that superior savings technology because Bitcoin cannot be manipulated, cannot be debased and cannot be printed. Well, it's that, right? People conflate or they were taught that price is value, which it is not. You know, and, and and you mentioned S and P five hundred. I uh, I would invite you to go to tradingview.com and then get the Nasdaq and put it in M two money supply, right? And so for the people listening, M two money supply is well, it's an approximation of the amount of of units of the dollar, right? Because nobody knows how how many there are already there. But if you look at in dollar terms, Nasdaq, you know, almost all time high or near the top or whatever. Um, and you look then, for example, at like the 2000 dot com bubble, right? With like a huge crash. You see that if you do, if you get it denominated in dollars. But if you denominate it in M2 money supply, which would represent the actual value, right? Then you see that we are now, 24 years after the dot com bubble, we are lower in value than at the, at the top of the dot com bubble which no rational person would agree with because our technology, you know, NASDAQ is a technology index. Our technology is way, arguably way better, like provably way better than 24 years ago. Way, way, way better by a factor of, I don't know, maybe a hundred or a thousand, probably more with all the AI stuff, right? And in real value, it is lower than the top of the dot-com bubble. And when I saw that, I was like, yeah, this this shows that the money is broken. Like that, what you use to to denominate the value in that that is what is broken. And I think that is the most important thing that people should see. Actually, like like that illustration and understanding like the difference between value and price, which is just a totally totally different thing. But yeah, how do you see that? Like, what what do you think is the most important thing people should understand about like the financial system? I think that that broken money analogy is probably the best. Um, I saw a post a couple months back on Twitter and it showed a son who was helping his mom move out of their, their old house, their old family house. And in the walls 
they had found all these dollar bills and it was basically her life savings that she had hidden away, you know, under the mattress, so to speak, um, after 40 years of work. And the, the saddest part is, you know, some of those bills were no longer legal tender. They were no longer accepted because they'd been replaced. And the purchasing power, when she earned those those dollar bills, um, was significantly higher than it is today because of that debasement. And so the purchasing power has been diluted by that money printer. And I think that's probably one of the hardest things for people to grasp, right? You know, a lot of people think that they put money in a bank as a savings technology, um, not knowing that every time the money printer goes, the purchasing power of that dollar that's saved in the bank actually diminishes and dilutes. And the other part of it is when people put money in a bank, they actually have to ask permission many times to get that money out of the bank. They have to and pay so, for it to put it in the bank. <laughs> you have to pay to open a, an account to have yeah. them hold your money. Um, unbeknownst to you, they're probably doing some sort of fractional reserve lending against your money that you don't get to see any benefit from. And so th there's just a lot of things that are uh, hidden behind the curtain of a broken money system that it takes time for people to study and learn. And if you could just, you know, find a, an area that resonates with people, I think that's what helps get them started on their journey. But I think broken money is, is probably one of the ones that people ought to be studying. And what that eventually leads them to is other forms of savings technologies yeah. and, eventually to Bitcoin. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm, I'm looking up uh, a tweet. Uh, this is a video, but uh, yeah, like if you find this, these dollar bills in the, in the wall, right. And I think ev even words like purchasing power, people don't really understand, right. Purchasing power is just how many units do you need to, to buy the same thing now and 10 years ago and 15 years ago, you know, how, what can you buy? with one dollar or euro or you know whatever currency and i saw this um this tweet by peter saint Ange, who's a great great guy to follow and he says um the trillion dollar foreign exchange industry uses big mac price as the ultimate inflation indicator it doesn't lie it's not adjusted by government statisticians in fact inflation is closer to the big mac's 88 percent than the government's 21 percent and they have like this overview in a table and they say like the, at the end of 2019, um, a Big Mac was $3.99 and mid-2024, it's $7.49, which is up 87.7%. And the McChicken even went from $1.29 to $3.89, which is 201%. And yeah, it's fascinating, right? So let's say you saved these dollars maybe from 1970 or 1980 and you find them in 2020. You cannot even buy the same, you know, Mac chicken <laughs> or Big Mac, I think. I love that illustration because those are things that, that people actually relate to, right? Like it's not that many times that you buy a house or a car or like a big something big, right? But people do go to McDonald's. Actually, the same guy, Peter St. Ange, he shared that 87% of Americans now view fast food as a luxury, which was wild to hear. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the other one that, that uh, speaks to that, um, back during Christmas time, it was the, the meme floating around about Home Alone and how Kevin was able to buy a cart full of groceries oh, for yeah. <laughs> $19 and try going to the grocery and filling a cart for $19 today. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I found it so fascinating that people don't wake up to this or that they, they don't feel you don't have to understand it immediately. I definitely did not understand this immediately, but it should trigger something in you. I think, I hope, I don't know what, what I think. I think I hope it, you know, that, that people are like, okay, you know, yeah. how does this work? Unfortunately, I was having a conversation with somebody not too long ago and what he said really made sense, right? People are struggling financially today and 
they're they're kind of stuck in that hamster wheel and they don't have quite the luxury of time to zoom out and evaluate, you know, their their position and search for, you know, a better savings technology. They're they're really they really are trapped on that that fiat hamster wheel. And yeah. it, and it's sad to think about that, you know, the way the system is set up against the people to keep them working longer, harder for less money, um, really, really does feel like theft once you understand it. But a lot of people, they don't have that, that time to really study, study Bitcoin or study economics and finance and monetary systems. So it's, yeah. it's a sad state we're in right now. Yeah, I would agree. I think, I, I think you're totally right. You know, even if you experience a problem, you don't have space to investigate it, which in my mind actually solidifies the problem, right? Like yeah. it's very sad. And and I think yeah. that's a hat tip to to you and a lot of the other people in the Bitcoin space and really to all Bitcoiners. You know, I think Bitcoiners really love talking about Bitcoin. And I think it's it's kind of a testament to Bitcoiners, you know, willing to try to jumpstart people's education. Like if you think back when you first started or when I first started, what probably took us 10 or 20 or 30 hours now speaking to someone who's been in Bitcoin for a while, really, it, it may be a, a 20 or a 30 minute or a one hour conversation to really jumpstart their education. And so I yeah. think that's you know a testament to all of the educators and advocates out there. Yeah, I would agree. I think uh, I, I think that is in general, all of our uh, for a challenge for everyone, right? Like if you get to talk to someone for 30 minutes, like what are the things that you could say to hopefully trigger something in them that would, yeah, help them get started, right? Like, like I, and, and I love in general the message about it's not buy Bitcoin, right? It's study Bitcoin because you cannot orange pill someone else and they have, they have to, they have to do that themselves. But you ha you you could definitely help them find like the thread or the trigger that works for them, right? Actually, yesterday when I was doing that interview, I was this this uh, woman who was doing it. She is like an investment expert. She's not into gold. She's then more into stocks, and she's like, yeah, I understand how Bitcoin works, but there's still this feeling inside of me that it all could you know crash or something. And I don't, I know it's not really a rational thing, but I don't really know why I think that. And then, you know, I just asked like why questions, like where does that come from? Like, can, can, can we go back to that? You know, and then she's like all into stocks and I'm like, how are you gonna, how, uh, you know, if, if, if World War III happens, she used that example, right? Like if that happens, what happens to Bitcoin? I said, what happens to your stocks? Right? Like, <laughs> how are you going to take your stocks? Like, are you going to call the broker and be like, well, uh, you know, shit's going down. I need to sell my stocks. Can you do it for me? And they're like, yeah, you're not the only one, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know? And like, how are you going to, it's, it, 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 I tried to illustrate it like that because she was so into, into it. Right. And, uh, I got her somewhere, not not there yet, but I was like, I, I can just get up and move. And you cannot, you know, and that is your problem. I said it in a nice way, right? But I think <laughs> that is the, so, so you still, I know I can trust myself because I own that what I, um, well, I don't own, it's my property, right? It's, it's also uh, something, property versus ownership, I think is interesting, right? So you own your stocks on paper. It says, you know, your name and you have these amount of stocks, but it's not your property. You don't actually have it. You know, you cannot get up and move and then, you know, pay for your safety by <laughs> by selling some stocks uh, in a situation like that. So I, I hoped, um, I hope like I got to her in that way, but it's like that, right? Like that's the challenge. You have to find that little thread and then just, you know, you, you don't have to try to convince other people. I think just illustrate what the differences are between what they are following um, and, and what, what we are following. And uh, yeah, it was really nice to experience actually because she was really curious. So she was really open to also receiving that. Yeah, I think that's a great analogy you used. And really it highlights, you know, the, the beauty of uh, Bitcoin and self-custody. You know, we see a lot of the turmoil around the world right now. And self-custody allows people to 
cross borders, travel across seas with their entire wealth intact. Whereas, you know, holding it in stocks, like you said, um, that's just paper. Right? That's a paper IOU for something that has your name associated with it. But when, you know, the shit hits the fan, that paper could be worthless in the future. The same with, with property. You know, you can't take the land with you. Hmm. You can't take the house with you across borders, but you can take those 24, those 12 words um, that you self-custody Bitcoin with, um, whether that's, you know, hardware, multi-sig, single sig, what have you. But you can take that private key with you anywhere you go to secure that wealth. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't don't realize the power of self-custody in Bitcoin and they are much more comfortable, you know, hitting the easy button with stocks or with real estate. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking now, like as an example, let's say you, you, you're fleeing to another country and you'll, you'll be like, yeah, I have a $3 million house. Like I'm good for 3 million, you know, like, look, here's <laughs> like the title deed, you know, this document that, I signed with a with a pen and made on the computer, you know, that like you have to trust me. Like this is the thing. I think that's that that should be the example that we should be using, right? Or you show your app and be like, yeah, this is my stock portfolio. Like, you know, I have a million in stocks. Can I buy, you know, your bread or or gasoline or whatever? But that's not anyone can show that, right? And yeah. and there's only one thing you can really verify in a situation like that. And yeah. Yeah, interesting. Interesting to think about. It's I, I love that it's so simple. It's 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 so simple, but it's so hard to understand. Because yeah, people are so preoccupied with all these notions that they don't even understand why they have them, right? Like and again, I had the same, right? So it takes some time to to go through that. But it's just they think things work in a certain way, but they actually don't. Because there is something that is better at you know, yeah, showing yeah. that you own something. Yeah, I think the simplicity is so beautiful. But at the same time, I think that there's there's many hours of education to distill it down to that simplicity. Um, you yeah. know, there's it takes education to build that conviction. And once you have that conviction, it, it really is very simple. Um, but for folks who haven't done the study, it, it probably looks extremely confusing and they're, they're not willing to take, you know, their, their net worth, their $500,000 house and sell it for Bitcoin when they don't necessarily understand it. And the other part of that too, is if they don't understand it and eh, the first sign of trouble, they're going to be the ones who capitulate and sell. Mm. And it's probably at the worst possible time. And so it's, it's a balance, right? You've got to invest the hours, the time, the energy to do the homework, do the proof of work and do the study. And then once you arrive at that point, then it, it really is very simple. Yeah. It's funny because once you accept that, because if, if, when you hear it's that simple and it's so transparent, it sounds too good to be true. <laughs> and that is why people doubt it. Right. And they come up with all these different questions, you know, and, and, um, as you say, like arguments against it, etc. Like yesterday, this woman also said to me, well, if, if you know, World War Three and the EMP bombs and whatever, like then, you know, what do you do with your Bitcoin? I said, what do you do with your stocks, right? Like just this question is so far away from like the core of what we should talk about. But but you do not see it because it sounds too good to be true. And 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 I think it's it's part of the fiat mindset, right? That you think like, no, it cannot be like that. Oh, this is ultimately transparent, right? So everyone gets checked all the time if they comply with the rules really like does it really work? yes it does really work like that you know and i think because it sounds too good to be true it, it is this eventually you know the ego test because once you get over that once you were like oh damn yeah this was really like these were really like the glasses that i had on right this is how i really viewed the world and i was wrong you know and 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 only after that you can realize like, yeah, it's really that simple. Like them, like I can just adopt this. And then, yeah, I, I always say like, I free my mind, you know, like then it's done. Like I don't have to, 
I don't want to say be, I don't have to be skeptic anymore or something, but I can, tr I can verify something for myself and therefore I can trust my own thinking and I don't have to rely on third parties or obscure, you know, terms and, uh, you know, signing certain documents, blah, blah, blah. Like this is just, it's so transparent that, you know, I'm invited to verify it for myself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's like, um, it sounds like you run your own node as well. And I think that that's one of the things that's, um, is probably not done quite as often, even with Bitcoiners. You know, we look at like the number of addresses that hold more than 0.1 Bitcoin and then compare that to the number of uh, nodes running around the world. Um, and the numbers are, are vastly different, but the power of running your own node, you know, it gives you added privacy. It allows you to verify your own transactions on your own hardware. Um, it allows you to broadcast your own transactions um, every 10 minutes it's done as well. And so you're not reliant on that untrusted third party at the bank to tell you what your balance is. And it doesn't take hours on the phone to argue with them when your balance looks correct. You know, it's audited every okay. 10 minutes around the world. And I think that, you know, that's one of the things that more and more people and more and more Bitcoiners should do is run their own notes as well. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. You sometimes see also these news items, right? Where it's like uh, there, there was like an error in the in a banking app, and it showed the wrong uh, amount on the uh, on the screen. You know, like sometimes you see like these news things, and I think like that that is exactly it. That's what you're saying. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, we corrected the number on the screen again. <laughs> you know, like just, that sounds so ridiculous now when when like you see that. But I think we should stay like positive about it like it's it sounds ridiculous but but still people you know believe what they see on 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 the screen in their banking app and we should be uh compassionate i want to say <laughs> you know like uh it's uh it's uh, we should come at it always from a positive angle and um yeah in that way try to try to help others i um i wanted to ask you you know because of your your military background as well like you have problem solving, embracing risk, personal leadership, you know, those types of things are all core to the military uh, experience. How did that help shape your understanding of Bitcoin, if any? You know, it's, uh, it's interesting because while I've been involved in Bitcoin for a number of years now, I didn't really talk about it much at work. There was a lot of risk of reputational damage associated with being a Bitcoiner in the military. Thankfully, we've got guys like um, uh, Jason Lowry who have mm -hmm. really come out into the public. Unfortunately, right now, he's um, he's not allowed to talk about Bitcoin or use the B word in social media. Um, but I think a lot of the, the tenets and foundations in military kind of help uh, shape mindsets within Bitcoin. Um, for me... A lot of that is is related to like adversarial mindset, um, especially when you look at things like uh, Corey Klipstein's uh, race to avoid the war, which really speaks to that adversarial mindset. Um, in the military, we we always look at things from, you know, adversaries or potential adversaries and how we might affect their decision making process. And I think a lot of that is similar to the Bitcoiner mindset on um, taking an adversarial perspective, whether that's from the look of a nation state or from, you know, bad actors trying to $5 wrench you for your Bitcoin. And so I take that, that framework that we used in the military and kind of apply that to Bitcoin is, is one of the ways. And then as far as decision-making, you know, in the military or in the air force, at least we, we use the thing called the OODA loop. And I've actually started seeing like uh, Stefan use it on social media, which I, th which I think is awesome. But the OODA loop is, you know, observe, orient, decide, act, and then repeat. It's just this big loop. And I think Bitcoiners do a lot of that same mental gymnastics when they observe what's going on around the world in their local economies. And then they orient to what they what they support or they believe they decide. And from a Bitcoiner perspective, they decide to utilize it as a savings technology, implement that action, and then, you know, iterate within that loop. And so I think it's 
for me, a lot of the mindset from a military background really translates into, um, into Bitcoin. Yeah. So why do you think Bitcoin is such a big idea? What's your explainer for that? I think that it has the potential to change the entire world. You know, we talked a lot about manipulation of fiat money and, um, you know, debasement and inflation. And we talked about the absolute finite scarcity of Bitcoin and how it can't be, you know, paper IOU'd because it is um, audited every 10 minutes. So I think that it has the potential to fix a lot of the things that are broken in the world today. And when we talk about things that are broken, you know, I love how Jeff Booth puts it, whether that's inflation is theft, taxation is theft, and that is done through debasement of the monetary system. You can't do that with Bitcoin. You know, you can't change the denominator to 42 million Bitcoin because no one else would follow you and run nodes in support of, you know, new Bitcoin 42 million supply. But I think that the the biggest challenge is going to be the adoption, right? You know, we've got so few people that are actually utilizing and transacting Bitcoin on a regular basis. But uh, I think eventually we'll get there, uh, whether that's through proof of work in people studying Bitcoin or that's proof of pain and people living with the manipulated fiat system. Um, but Bitcoin has the potential to, to fix, uh, fix the broken money system that we live in today. So what do you think could be the changes that widespread adoption could bring then in our societies? Yeah, I, I think that it's going to be, um, you know, we talked about the price of goods decreasing in Bitcoin terms, right? And Bit and Jeff Booth talks about um, the price of goods dropping down to the marginal supply of production. And you don't have things like housing, which is constantly going up in value to the point where, you know, people in young families can no longer afford a home because of that manipulation of the system. And so I think the affordability of housing is probably the easiest one for people to see that, you know, the price of a house drops down to its marginal cost of production and it's not 10 times what it really takes to be able to produce it. Uh, and that allows people, you know, the, the comfort and stability to be able to afford things such as a place to live, food on the table. And, and Bitcoin with its finite supply has the ability to fix that because it can't, it can't be debased and inflated and printed away. Yeah. I guess yeah. another way of saying it is it is the fair ledger that we talked about, right? If we think of money as the ledger of your time, energy, and productivity to the world, but the money that we use today is manipulated and printed and debased, Bitcoin has the ability to bring that fair ledger back, right? Where it cannot be debased, it cannot be inflated away. And so your time, energy, productivity stored in Bitcoin allows that to remain constant outside of a manipulated system. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. What I wanted to say is that I think the, the aligned incentives that we mentioned before within Bitcoin, they translate to you know, the 3D world when it's used as a reward for for the productivity that you mentioned, right? And so b because when we use it as a reward for that productivity, for real energy expended in, in time, then the person expending that energy in time, the person getting the reward also has their incentives aligned with, with that reward, basically. So they are incentivized to actually deliver value, whereas now we have a reward that can be infinitely created. And so that entire incentive to a deliver actual value or enough value for the amount of units that you get of the currency, yes, yeah, totally perverse almost right like it's not to the best of your ability because you know why would you spend your finite energy and time and get rewarded in something that can be created infinitely so i think 
it distorts the incentives, you know, the broken money. And if we use money where all the incentives for its creation and its security, et cetera, decentralization are all aligned, then that translates into the into the treaty world. Um, yeah, I would agree. I think, you know, we we will make like crazy buildings again too, you know, like, or like these, uh, back in ancient Greece, they had like these huge statues, right? Where, where the ships would go under when they entered the port and stuff like that. I think people will find like, uh, joy in building that again. Right. And, and, and they will be proud of building that again. Like no one is thinking about doing that now because they cannot create the time and space to actually, to even think about what that, would look like or how that would work because they don't have the, the money that they use to save doesn't work for them. So, you know, as you also said before, like people don't have time to do these big things. Yeah. I think that's another, um, another aspect of Bitcoin that is probably in a lot of people's blind spots. And it's kind of what you were alluding to. And it's that, that value for value, especially on like the, the creativity side, you know, the artists, the musicians, the sculptors, um, there's now an opportunity for people transacting value for value on Bitcoin to be able to showcase and demonstrate, um, you know, their craft and their, their artistry. Whereas with a money, a fiat money system, there are less incentives to be able to, showcase that craft. Whereas with Bitcoiners, Bitcoiners are very often willing to support other Bitcoiners in their freedom of expression in their artistry. Yeah. And how do you think it could, you know, Bitcoin could shift balance in, in, in global power? Do you, do you look at the game theory at all, like of countries adopting, etc.? But also, and you mentioned Jason, and I wanted to ask you about it. Like, what do you think of his software thesis? You know, I, I only because I don't. So upfront, I don't know Jason um, personally. Um, I think that his thesis on software, software, definitely has merit. Um, it's a very clear. Um, translation from the physical world when he talks about antlers and deer and things like that. Um, I think the biggest delta is do these animals in the natural world think primarily instinctually or do they actually weigh, um, you know, the cost benefit analysis or the pros and cons or the advantages, disadvantages that people normally do. Um, so I, th I think his thesis is fascinating, um, but I think it's yet to be tested and like fully tested. I don't think that it would be a strong deterrence um, between two nation states who have a fundamental disagreement and that disagreement is, is so great that they're willing to go to war. I don't know that the thesis holds up in those situations. Um, but I think I think it's absolutely fascinating, and I think it's one of those things that more people at least need to read and consider, and then decide for themselves. Yeah, I think he does talk about that that part that you just mentioned, right? Like the the um, like a, a jaguar or um, whatever. They're they're gonna go for a jaguar and an antelope is a bad example because I don't think jaguars live with antelopes. I mean, like a like a cougar, <laughs> you know, like they're gonna get an antelope and not an elephant, right? I think that's what he talks about about the the power projection of the elephant over the over the cougar. Although the cougar is probably you know faster, etc., and can jump on his back or whatever. Like the cougar is not even gonna try to attack the elephant. They're always gonna attack the the animal that they can project more power over and. Uh, for for which they have to extend uh, expend less power um, than you know what the the calories of the animal eventually bring them right and he I think he has examples of when let's stick with the cougar example right like if he has to chase an animal for too long they're also going to stop because then the the, the risk reward is is just not um, not aligned anymore 
Um, but yeah, interesting what you said. I, I think I think the animal examples are very good, but I would agree if there's a fundamental conflict with countries, then I, I think it's a fair point to think about like would that hold up? But yeah, in general, would you do you think that adoption of Bitcoin by countries can also shift? the power projection in a sense in the, in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd mentioned earlier, like the, the game theory of Bitcoin adoption. And I think it's, it's interesting because we're, we're living it and it's playing out. I think it's playing out today and right now. Um, you know, we've got El Salvador on the map. Who knows what Argentina is going to do from a nation state perspective, if we look at like the de-dollarization um, and countries no longer or buying fewer uh, U.S. treasuries and instead buying more and more gold um, held within their reserve, you know, I think it's only a matter of time before countries start to pivot away from gold and start to accumulate Bitcoin if they haven't already. And so I think the the game theory of Bitcoin is uh is playing out right in front of us yeah i agree i'm super uh excited to to see who's gonna be like el salvador's follower right like who's gonna be the first serious serious follower and just like the just thinking about the game theory i think is so so interesting right because eventually if if you have an enemy country that would adopt bitcoin and they would be very public about it, right? They would say like gold sucks or something like that. I think it's funny because you you will be forced to adopt it too. Even if you're just thinking about it or not or 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 even dismissing it, right? You'll be like, okay, what what do they know that we don't know? Or what do they think about this that we maybe don't think about this right like i think that that game theory on a country level is just very very fascinating because eventually and i like that in general when you think about bitcoin eventually we are all individuals right like all organizations are individuals just like you know blackrock adopting bitcoin and um you know uh eventually in 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 government it's all also just individuals and you you already see that in america right there there are a lot of uh congress members who totally understand bitcoin it's not a lot but they are there right and if they eventually have a certain position of power within you know the area that they operate in then they also have the space and time to to share that message and then you know get more individuals in the same realm to to follow them and so yeah i think i think it's just fascinating it's it's fascinating to follow but i would agree like if there are already countries there probably are already countries that that have it um but they're obviously quiet about it which for me would imply that they are small countries because they just don't want to be uh uh you know, put out of the game, I would say. You know, if they are too vocal about it and a big country comes along and starts accumulating, then they have less chance, right? So, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, and I think the the game theory at so many different levels, like you mentioned, um, is is really interesting. You know, starting at like the individual level of, you know, if a person accumulates more Bitcoin, that incentivizes all of the people around them to at least consider it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you've got institutions like you mentioned, the Black Rocks, or you've got Michael Saylor with MicroStrategy, Dorsey with Block, who's announced he's buying Bitcoin all the time. Uh, Similar Scientific, who just announced that they've gone to a Bitcoin treasury asset strategy. Um, I think eventually more and more individuals, corporations, nations are going to adopt Bitcoin. And really, that's when the game theory starts to play out because all of the others who don't have exposure or a position in Bitcoin are either going to be left behind or they're going to be incentivized to start accumulating as well. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So do you see Bitcoin as a technology or also a philosophy? I see it as both. 
um, to be honest. I mean, you know, based on my background, the the technology really resonated uh, with me when I first started my Bitcoin journey. Um, but the longer I've been in Bitcoin and the more I zoom out, I think there's a lot of philosophy built into it as well. Um, one that jumps out at me probably the most off the top of my head is time preference, right? You know, when we were younger, um, we, we very often made money, made dollars to buy things that we thought would make us happy. Um, but that was, that was kind of fleeting. You know, it, it may have filled a void in your being temporarily, but then eventually that void came back and you had to buy something else or do something else to fill that emptiness or that void inside of you. Whereas with Bitcoin and a lower time preference, you start to see joy and fulfillment filling that emptiness inside of you outside of just physical material things. And really it's, uh, you know, do I have a better understanding of the world through the lens of Bitcoin? And am I willing to take more time to focus on, you know, my mental health or my physical health or my diet? And so I think that Bitcoin has a combination of both. For me, the technology is like the the gateway drug, so to speak, that got me in the door. But really looking through a Bitcoin lens is kind of changing my perspective and my philosophy on things uh, throughout my life. Yeah, I, I love that. I think what you just said about buying stuff that you don't need to <laughs> fill some type of void, I think is great because at least for me, the Bitcoin enables you to get that from inside. Right? Mm -hmm. Like just little things like trusting yourself, trusting your own judgment, trusting your own, yeah, proof of work, like the work that you put in to understand something and then taking the step to adopt it and discard like all these things you thought you learned or were true about the world. Um, yeah, just seeing the world in a different view and realizing that that is a nicer way for you to view the world and live your life. Right. And you didn't need to buy anything for that, like any junk, any stuff or whatever you tried before to fill that. Right. So yeah, I, I fully agree. I think it's really, uh, it's a philosophical exploration too, but also, you know, a lot of people talk about the spiritual journey of Bitcoin and yeah, I wanted to ask you if, if you experience something like that too, or like how, how has Bitcoin changed your life? You know, I'm not like a, uh, I'm not a very religious or spiritual type of person. I'm trying to change that. Um, but I won't try to impose that on your listeners. Um, but I will say that I don't know if, if Satoshi did it on purpose, but I think there are some parallels to religion in the way that Satoshi was able to walk away from Bitcoin. Like if you can imagine if Satoshi was alive today and had a million coins, how could he not cash out on, you know, the, the billions of dollars. And so I think there's something spiritual there with Satoshi. And even, even if it was, you know, years ago, um, for me, there's something spiritual with the way he created it and then gave it away and then walked away. And I think that that's, that's humbling, um, for me to consider, um, in Bitcoin is, can I also learn a similar lesson of, you know, maybe giving more to the world and expecting less in return. Um, and so that's probably, I don't know, one of the more spiritual things I would say that I learned from Bitcoin is trying to, to give back from all of the things that I've learned along this Bitcoin journey. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's a gift. 
right? It's a gift to us. And I love you. Uh, love that you use the word humble because I think it's that if you, when you un, when you see it as a gift, um, it humbles you because someone created something for us, and he's not using it. You know, and I think that's the inspiration to also create and not consume, right? What we just uh, talked about. And so it's it's kind of like a call to creation and, and ditch to consumption. Right? And I think that ties back to what, what the eventual effect of Bitcoin also is. If you can save the monetary energy that you gather through, you know, out, through value, to create uh, through creating value, and you can create space and time for yourself to then eventually start creating like that that sounds like a nice a nice circle a nice loop um so yeah i love that you i love that you shared that i uh also i i just kind of see it as a gift i think it's great that he's not there it could not work if he would be here right he would be a liability a liability yeah no i i completely agree i think that's uh that's probably one of the best things um the best gift he could have given Bitcoin was to walk away. You know, we, we briefly touched on shit coins and, um, you know, if he were here today, that would be something that, you know, a lot of the fudsters would, would talk about and point towards, um, but him walking away gave Bitcoiners that gift to be able to grow organically without any inside influence. And I think that that's, that's probably one of the best things that he could have, if not the best thing that he could have done for the Bitcoin ecosystem and the Bitcoin community. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So I also wanted to ask you what, because uh, you talk to a lot of people, of course, about Bitcoin and you try to to educate them as well. What is, what's like a common misconception that you still hear that you would like to debunk? Oh my gosh. Um it, it's funny because one that I heard recently was was where where is Satoshi? Um, but we've already talked about that. Um, I, I think one that I hear probably most often is uh, the comment that Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme, and it, it's it's crazy to me because this is like the same fud that's been going around um, for like two cycles now. People mm. still think that that. Um, Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. The other one that I hear often is, you know, the environmental impacts that Bitcoin creates on the world, the energy consumption or, you know, boiling a pool every hour or something related to, to that. Um, yeah. and, and I think it's, it's an example of people not actually um, understanding the energy resources or sources of energy, I should say, that a lot of current Bitcoin mining actually utilizes um, that that automatically debunks um, that energy consumption argument. But those are probably the two that I hear most often is, um, you know, the, the energy consumption is going to be greater than, you know, the entire world outputs energy in five years or it's still a Ponzi scheme. Um, unfortunately, those those two couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. Well, to the energy argument, I always say, well, look around you. Everything costs energy to create or maintain. Like you don't. Uh, this this argument it was funny. That again, this interviewed her yesterday. She is like, yeah. What I don't like about Bitcoiners is is that if someone doesn't agree with them, they just say like you haven't studied enough. I said, no. It's only. They only say that when they hear the argument you're using is super fucking flawed, right? <laughs> like that's when they say it. Like you say it because you hear the argument is just empty. Yeah, it uses too much energy. Yeah, compared to what? And why do you say that, right? Even when you just ask these two things, the, it's it's done already. Everything costs energy to create or maintain. And the more efficient we use energy, the more energy we can and should use because, you know, uh, optimal use of energy 
is what creates our progression as humans. But yeah, once you say that, you know, th then there's probably a silence also. But I, I, I love, I love to hear that one because they are uh, like a lot of these critiques are so empty, right? Like the same as like a Ponzi scheme. I talked to Matt Kaiser and he said like, you know, Bitcoin is the anti-Ponzi scheme. Because we are like, yeah, please don't buy because then I cannot buy anymore, right? Like, what, <laughs> Nobody says you should buy Bitcoin, which is the essence of a Ponzi scheme is you should join us, you know, you should join us and I can get you in, you know, and we don't, we don't want you in <laughs> actually, <laughs> right? And so I, I, yeah, crazy. Does it still bother you or, or do you enjoy it uh, as like trying to, 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 to have a rebuttal to it? You know, it it's exhausting. Um, I think a lot of times on social media too, there are some people who are just engagement farming. Um, mm -hmm. So they'll they'll go and say, "Oh, it's a Ponzi," and try to argue with you, or you know, put some stats about the energy consumption um, just to drive traffic to you know their page or that site. Um, so a lot of times I'll just kind of let it go. Really, I've, I've started to kind of pivot and focus and try to spend my time on people who are genuinely interested. You know, I think that there's probably a return on my time and a focused attention on their questions versus trying to convince everybody all at once. And so if people are still stuck on it's a Ponzi scheme, then... <laughs> A lot of times I might just leave it at that and say, hey, maybe Bitcoin isn't for you. Maybe maybe you should just go buy the ETF instead. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if there's genuine interest or I tell them reasons why it's not a Ponzi scheme and they, they have more questions and they're asking the right questions, then I'm willing to invest the time. But other than that, it's, uh, yeah, let people believe what they want to believe. Yeah. And you mentioned to me before we we started recording. You emailed me. You you know you also help people with their their setup, um, how how people store their Bitcoin. Like how how do you approach your you know personal security and storage of your Bitcoin and you know like all the possible threats that are out there or like how you how you could secure it. You know using two factor authentication, multi sig. All, the, all these things. Can you share a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so for me, I won't go into like, you know, my my personal um, custody structure, but mm. I will say that I think it's important for people to um, understand, you know, the, the spectrum of options available to them. You know, whether that's a hot wallet when they're just starting off and they're, you know, doing DCAs over Lightning and then eventually getting to a large enough UTXO size to be able to move that on chain to cold storage um, and then doing education on, you know, single SIG hardware, air gapped hardware, um, strategies to secure those 12 or those 24 words, considerations on using a 25th word passphrase. And then once that amount gets to a, a more significant life-changing amount, or if you are of the mindset of treating whatever Bitcoin you have today as if it was 10 times or 100 times more than it is in fiat terms, you know, considering uh, multi-sig addresses or multi-sig wallets, having an understanding of the two of three to be able to transact out, as well as having an understanding of having a three of three X pub to be able to recreate that address, to be able to transact. I think a lot of people um, who are new to multi-sig don't necessarily understand that. Um, and then I also like to talk to people about entropy and how they can verify entropy with online tools, like uh, the one from Ian Coleman. And then for folks who are not comfortable with doing a full self custody multi-sig, um, you know, explaining to them the breadth of other options, whether that's collaborative custody with an institution that holds one of, you know, the three keys in a two of three multi-sig, or what we've seen lately with institutional collaborative custody, where you've got three institutions that each hold a key um, 
and unfortunately you have to KYC with them, but then, you know, you verify your identity with them prior to transacting out. And so really it's understanding all the different avenues of self-custody I think is important for people. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. I think it's also kind of like a search, you know, as to how, how you want to set it up, how it works in your life, in your situation. And there's so many options. I see you're wearing the Unchained uh, <laughs> t-shirt. I think they offer a great service uh, as well. Um, yeah, interesting, man. What, what are, um, are there any resources you could recommend for people to check out? Oh, wow. You know, I've, people have asked me this a number of times. I think maybe I should like start a podcast or start a newsletter or something. Um, cause I don't have anything that I could, you know, directly point to. And unfortunately I think that's based on my background with, um, cybersecurity. Um, so maybe that's like a homework assignment for me. Um, but I think it, it's just having an understanding of, um, all of understanding your information and how it transits from your computer to the internet, to whatever service and back. And once you connect those, you know, I think the big challenge is identifying those dots, right? And then the next challenge is creating links between all of those dots. And then we talked about earlier that adversarial mindset is now turning it around and saying, what are the risks at each of those links and each of those dots and how could my information be compromised or how could, um, you know, that lead to an attempt, a phishing attempt or a man in the middle attack to attack me personally or to attack my Bitcoin holdings. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have one single resource, but maybe, like I said, that's a homework assignment for me to go create. Yeah. Well, maybe this is the signal, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that would be great. No, I think I think uh, there is some content around it, but um, just helping people set up, you know, in different phases of understanding, I think uh, I think would be a great idea. So maybe this is your calling to to create <laughs> that. Awesome, man. Well, I wanted to ask you my last question, and I ask everyone the same question, which is, what is a core belief that you will never let go? Oh wow. You know, it's interesting because I think Bitcoin has kind of forced me to challenge um, previous core beliefs. Um, but I think one that's kind of uh, one that stuck with me for a while and um, has survived the scrutiny of Bitcoin and actually it's gotten reinforced and stronger through Bitcoin is, uh, and I, I don't know the attribution to this quote. I should go look it up. Um, but it's, it goes like this is, I don't want an easy life. I want to be a stronger person. And that's one of the things that I think about often. And like I said, I think Bitcoin has reinforced that um, either through self-custody. Um, you know, I don't want uh, a custodial solution because it's easy and it's simple. Um, I would much rather do the work of self-custodying my own Bitcoin. And then it's also reinforced by, by time preference, like we talked about earlier, is I want the personal fulfillment to be able to do the work and I'm accepting a longer or a lower time preference in order to do that. Um, and the fruits of that labor is, you know, that education, that understanding and that learning so that's probably the the core belief that has stayed with me the longest, even through this Bitcoin journey. Love that. Thanks for sharing. And thanks so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. I'll make sure to link to your X profile in the show notes so people can follow you for when you announce that uh, self-custody, uh, <laughs> I don't know, education hub. <laughs> and uh, yeah, man, thanks so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for taking the time to chat with me.
I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.